professional note that uh, when I was a uh, first year uh, PhD student in graduate school uh, some 20 years ago, I remember distinctly reading uh, one of uh, Professor Kulikowski's uh, books and saying, wow, this is, uh, this is something I would like to do one day. And uh, uh, I want to thank him for providing uh, the inspiration quite then and the technical knowledge. And uh, without uh, further delay, let me welcome him to the podium for his talk today, which is uh, entitled Innovation and Competency in Biomedical Informatics, <coughs> Analytics and Knowledge Integration Across the Translational Spectrum. So thank you. Thank you very much for your kind words, Constantine. It's a pleasure to be here. Sorry for the delay. We had a forced march from around Grand Central, but we made it. Um, Let's see, what do I press for the slides? So this is, as you can see, the title. Um, now I just have to find out how to move the slides forward, which button to press. Um, volume, da, 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 da. down here, thank you. Is that it? Click. Oh, there we go. Right. Right, thank you. So, the motivation comes from my own experience and from figuring out that not only is translational medicine a key field, but as uh, Constantine mentioned, I'm uh, editor of the Yearbook of Medical Informatics, so I get to read an awful lot of papers, review them. We every year select what considered to be the best uh, contributions in biomedical informatics in every field. And the awareness uh, that one gets when you read enough of these is that, of course, there's very different criteria for competency and innovation in whether one is doing research or whether one is in practice, because one is dealing, in one case, with scientific discovery and innovation versus knowledge uh, integration in the other case that uh, tries to inf develop best practices from clinical experience. Biomedical informatics spans the spectrum from basic research to healthcare practice. So the ways in which innovation and competency are defined, measured, and practiced are extremely different across the spectrum. I've had about 40 years experience in pattern recognition and data and signal analysis, artificial intelligence, medical modeling, imaging, decision making, and various systems designs. We, for instance, developed the first causal network for describing diseases uh, back with Dr. Aaron Sapphire at Mount Sinai back in the 1970s. Then we developed the first expert system on a chip that went into a medical instrument that uh, was a scanning densitometer. Uh, and then we uh, have done a lot of other firsts, including more recently a number of algorithms in bioinformatics. But I'm always looking for new ways for understanding and modeling complex problems involving what is now called analytics, in other words, the analytical side, but also a synthetic side, knowledge integration across the spectrum of biomedical problems. And I was asked to be on the American Medical Informatics Association's, or AMIA, Core Competencies Committee for Biomedical Informatics, which is the more general topic, since they've already developed another committee, Core Competencies for Clinical Informatics, and it looks like it's going to become a, medical a recognized medical specialty. The idea, then, is we would like to try to see how we can bridge the entire spectrum. So, innovation and competency, usually we mean basic human skills, knowledge, how we analyze problems, how we learn, uh, not just from data but from prior knowledge, and how we are creative in coming up with new ways of representing problems and knowledge, and designing experiments. But we live in this world where in order to get anything done, we have to be competent. So it's a very vast ocean. But our islands of innovation often are very small. On one hand, we're expected to be competent, 
have effect, be effective in our use of skills and knowledge. But seeing and generating new problem formulations and solutions to them is, of course, the tough part. Now, one definition of biomedical informatics is computational methods and tools for modeling, analyzing, integrating, and interpreting diverse sources of data, knowledge, in healthcare, practice, research, and education. And translational medicine, arguably the grandest of challenges for understanding health and disease by bridging biology and medicine. So we have this tremendous spectrum from the nano or even lower to the macro levels, from basic science to through the practice of healthcare, where the types of informatics that one does goes from analyzing data and knowledge that is you know, highly uncontrolled, that is out there, to well-formulated controlled clinical trials and epidemiological studies. And finally, we have to ask ourselves, how does this translational medicine that we are supposed to be developing build on what we're beginning to know is as a model of the systems that constitute the human body and the environments of the human body. Now, there are very many different uh, biomedical models from molecules through cells, tissues, organs, systems, which we analyze doing experimental discovery science. But systems analysis is critical, and engineering and design is equally critical if we're going to then have practical systems that will go into clinical practice and have an impact on public health. But the range of mathematical models and analytical techniques that are computationally feasible to model systems and to obtain the integration of knowledge needed to answer questions is very wide also. Basis, basically, it's mathematical and statistical models of different kinds and logical models, which are implemented in the most basic form with programming languages, to which we add a lot of heuristics that are needed to handle specific problems. And eventually, we would like to have large-scale, effective systems for human-machine experimentation and practice. That would be the extension of the scientific method all the way if we can do it systematically. But the goals are very different. In the center of the spectrum, medical practice emphasizes personal decisions, diagnosis, prognosis, treatment of individuals. By medical research, we're looking at generalizable experimentation for discovery, in other words, evidence of patterns over groups of phenotypes and genotypes at different levels from molecules to organisms and populations. We have the traditional dichotomy between mechanism and hypothesis driven experimentation and discovery and stratified group population studies which can be exploratory and hypothesis driven but often have a very strong component of experimentation and discovery. In the middle of the spectrum, the medical specialist, the ex expert, has to synthesize everything on their own. Right? He or she traditionally uses their expertise and judgment and does it informally. But it's not scalable beyond small populations. And the re research team science that we are engaged in today needs much better phenotype definitions related to clinical endpoints that integrate many genotypic biomarkers plus, and this is where the bioinformatics comes in, the software for analytics and for knowledge integration. Now, it's been pointed out quite a few years ago, I believe from 2002, that we're dealing with maneuvering in a very complex path from genotype to phenotype. And these are just some of the steps with many more having been added since, with a big problem being precisely the issue of how one models dynamic regulatory systems. So, in a sense, the obstacle to really implementing integrated informatic systems that will help us day in and day out with complex translational systems is that we're dealing with difficult mixes of multiple inverse problems. Inverse inference of complex biological networks. For instance, the quote from Matthew Rockman here at NYU on developing 
quantitative genetics of transcript abundance, which helps build probabilistic causal networks for gene variants in, involved in different uh, quantitative trait uh, loci. Inverse problem of defining clinical phenotype endpoints, where most dramatically it's presented with trying to reconstruct and integrate imaging data from the clinic all the way from well-defined inverse problems like CT, where you know what you're doing in terms of your underlying physical model, to MRI and other functional imaging techniques that we want to integrate together, where the knowledge of how to integrate them present major barriers for phenotype definition. Question is, is it overwhelmingly difficult mixes of multiple inverse problems? At the clinical phenotype diagnostic level, we have not only numerical data, we have speech, we have text, and we have therefore the problem of language interpretation added to spatial distributions over images. Now, the current state of the art in a lot of the methods that we use, even the one quite effective ones, it's basically statistical classification. Associations between evidence and phenotype labels which are put into various kinds of networks and to which a wide variety of machine learning, pattern recognition or other learning techniques solve essentially inverse clinical inference problems but do it to some approximation. So there's progress but the progress is inadequate because the statistical and heuristic methods for learning apply well when we have good data, well-defined problems, but both natural language understanding and image understanding for these inverse problems present major challenges. And when we're trying to develop heterogeneous causal network reverse engineering for structuring what is now state-of-the-art Bayesian models for clinical inference, over these heterogeneous data sets, it's basically an open problem. Lots of approximation techniques and methods that do work to some degree, but we have not yet found a replacement for the individual physician who can do it, or healthcare worker who does it intuitively themselves. So, a different disciplinary perspective is we have contrasting disciplinary development of the subfields in biomedical informatics and go a little bit into the comparative history of bioinformatics and the medical health side in terms of how they've applied and developed analytics and knowledge integration. On the surface, we're dealing with great promise because there's a lot of overlap in the analytical methods, algorithms, database techniques, knowledge integration methods between the biological and the healthcare end. But if you look back historically to the about a little bit over half a century ago, the seminal paper that really made a difference was Ledley and Lustig's paper in Science in 59 on using Bayesian models for clinical inverse inference, followed by a a lot of work in computer-aided diagnosis, signal analysis, EKGs, images, lots of clinical algorithms for special problems, which were critical to establish reproducible clinical endpoints. And at the same time, at the National Library of Medicine, Medline was developed, which turned out to be another very different approach to problems, namely indexing the biomedical literature and classifying the biomedical literature in a way that would be useful for both research and practice. This turned out to be even more important for research than for practice. But at the same time that there's a lot of overlap in techniques, there's also a challenge in biomedical informatics that really we're not dealing with a single discipline, but with multiple disciplines, but two in particular. Very different content, very different problems for research versus the practice communities, as all of us who work in it know. Medical and health informatics developed around different kinds of clinical decision support with massive integration of data, all of it clinical data. The second phase was looking at the statistical methods that didn't scale at the time and developing ways of integrating expert knowledge 
which is an area where I came in with one of the first causal associational methods. And mycin is very well known, internus, the explain, uh, help, and so on. Image si and s signal storage analysis and interpretation systems were very successful in the 70s and 80s. And the first commercial decision support systems were deployed then. At the same time, mathematical biology developed a lot of models, many of them aimed at uh, phylogenetic analysis, and gradually morphed into bioinformatics, combining a variety of mathematical, statistical, and efficient computational methods in the 80s, and then pushed by the Human Genome Project and other opportunities, bioinformatics emerged and is often viewed very much in terms of the problem areas like genomics, proteomics, ph phylogenetics, and so on, which drive the field. And in phase three, what you have is the foundations for what we're talking about today. How can you apply ways of image signal analysis integrated with advanced instrumentation for functional imaging, on one end of the spectrum, the other end, meta-analysis, which for combining clinical trials and other study data, which was systematized through the Cochrane collaborations, and very slowly, painfully slowly, the development of electronic patient health records, which includes some rudimentary decision support, usually rule-based. However, it was derived by some of the analytical methods. But in the last decade, we see the development of the semantic web with ontologies, models of reality that describe the meaning of the different terms to provide these models that will help us align or provide data normalization so that you can make inferences in a reliable way and exchange knowledge and information. So on the one hand, bioinformatics has developed largely as solving a lot of biological problems in specific areas and thought of very often as simply being algorithms plus databases. Whereas clinical decision support, broader health support is this much more amorphous field with lots of different directions but all focused on the clinical data. And now we want to develop translational bridges. How to do that? Well, a way of looking at this particular metaphor is we have lots of new molecular diagnostics, molecular therapeutic methods on the one hand, which are very specific, very much oriented towards biology, and more generally, from AI, software engineering, we have intelligent software systems that allow us to put wrappers around pieces of software and have them in, interrelate and uh, work together and gradually the development of what is being called the semantic web, where meaning is exchanged, but also made consistent across multiple sources of information, uh, all computable. But how does it apply in translational problems? Big question, where is human intelligence still the key element, the synthesizing component, where, which is needed in order to know what analytical methods to apply, what knowledge integration methods to apply, and where is the problem well enough to find that we can do things automatically, where that really help. Unfortunately, the vast majority of problems in the translational field tend to be in the former. In other words, a human element, or maybe it's still good. We have a role to play, but it's not terribly efficient, right? And we can ask also, does existing technology simply need to be better applied, or are there novel opportunities at the human technology interfaces, and very importantly, novel formalisms for analysis and decision making that will know how to decompose a problem that we have, fit it to some known paradigms of these inverse problem solutions to some approximation, and if so, how well defined are they, or are they even definable? 
So from the health informatics perspective, we can say that the end of 20th century perspective was how do you integrate patient information, whether on paper or electronic health records, hopefully the latter, how to apply clinical guidelines and clinical trial information derived from groups and populations to an individual patient care, but also how to use this wealth of genomic and biomarker information on the web to support clinical decisions, which means a lot of literature analysis and trying to understand automatically whether we can get out of the literature what would otherwise be painfully read by a human expert. But as we all know, there's lots of problems that we face. On the data side, data capture for genotype, phenotype, and intermediate data is still very site dependent. Even though you can integrate data, you often don't know whether it's properly aligned or registered or standardized. Data can be unreliable and hard to normalize. There are not too many reliable reference or model sets. So I would identify as the fundamental obstacle complementarities and redundancies in the data which lead to overwhelming alignment and registration problems for heterogeneous data of sequence, structure, function, and multimodality imaging, which is not easy to determine from the literature or the deposited data from prior studies. In other words, critically analyzing existing literature and knowing whether we are to trust it is something that we all pride ourselves in being able to do if we're specialists in a field, but it's very hard for anyone who isn't, right? And so there are not enough people out there to really help with what could be called this alignment or registration, which involves careful, painstaking, time-consuming curation. And so methods for trying to do this automatically are a great priority. On the side of methodology, on the analytics and the knowledge integration. We have a comparable problem. There are many, many techniques for analysis, many techniques for inverse inference, many techniques for reconstruction of problems, situations, which depend on how we formulate them. But they tend to be non-standardized, hard to understand beyond the simple classification models, and very hard to evaluate by non-specialists because the mathematical and heuristic models are many, not easily mastered superficially. In order to build the computational models, lots of assumptions go into them. And the semantic web, which tries to standardize consistency of meaning, is still in its infancy, so the representations are exploratory. Not only that, but as we know, there's constant progress in wet lab experiments and silicon sciences and technology, unprecedented size, scale, and diversity. It's wonderful, but it's also a curse for knowing how to manage the information. So this knowledge, which is only partially and dynamically formalized in mathematical and statistical models for a variety of very useful applications, so heterogeneous at the modeling level, so heterogeneous at the problem solution level, what kind of functional encyclopedia do we really need? It's not a static ontology. This is the problem, right? And the deeper challenge is knowledge is embedded or ex implicit in all kinds of image data and schematics. What article in Science, Nature, or any of the other specialty journals doesn't include a wonderful schematic diagram that helps us really understand the article, right? Do we have any of that well-coded, represented even in the computer? Atlas data? Yes, that's partially computerized, and we know about registration when we have a good model of the underlying uh, anatomy, and if it's fixed. But we're talking about reference models that go beyond simple anatomical atlases, the physiology, and now at the biomolecular level, not there. Very difficult to do, right? And one of the reasons is we can't capture visual descriptions as well as we seem to be able to capture them ourselves as human experts. In other words, visual languages and semiotics have proven a very difficult set of challenges which you know, 
going to take a while to approach, but I think we're missing a lot because just doing superficial visualization models, however beautiful and sophisticated, isn't enough if you're going to have systems work automatically for you. So in some sense, one could say that the central translational medicine challenge is informatics. The massive expert combinatorial search and selection for trusted expert sources, studies, methods, and content for groups of patients. And filtering that for applicability to the individual. Keyed on or indexed by reliability of source information, a real problem, right? Interactions of content, real problem too, because a lot of subjective issues, and develop some sort of patient-specific information model. That is what we're after clinically. And it's what justifies a lot of what we do, right? And how do you apply it, both to the individual and the population models in the context of risk, cost, uncertainty of both evidence and the environment? Now, so this is the everything kitchen sink <laughs> recipe, right? <laughs> Mathematical, statistical, perceptual, and cognitive informatics, computationally scalable and individualizable. So easy to say, almost impossible to do, right? So scalability, I would argue, while difficult, up to now we've always been able to overcome it by a combination of new technologies and clever new theories. But a key question that we frequently do not ask ourselves is, is a particular theory adequate for translating some one of these general models from mechanism and group evidence to an individual? Is it, do we really know that it's applicable to a particular individual? And this has deep open epistemological questions which are both computational as well as underlying philosophical issues. Now, there's lots of great examples that are beginning to come out, including the one I mentioned before about reverse engineering genotype phenotype. Uh, and more recent critical one, understanding how important the microbiome is. Uh, lots of details. And out of all of this comes one key element that we know is what kind of analytical models do we have for biological network analysis? And can they be scaled to networks that deal with those translational bridges in other than fairly straightforward static reductionistic ways, right? Now, most of the models are rooted in large-scale network analysis for communications and various kinds of operations research involving a few number of criteria, often one, totally different than what we face in biology in homeostasis in the human body, right, or any other organism. And so methods of multi-criteria optimization and more importantly, satisficing, as Herb Simon pointed out, for economic problems, where bounded rationality has to be applied if you're going to be trying to figure out what things mean for individuals. You're not going to be able to get that from exact optimization models. So the next question we can pose, are the computational ontologies that are being developed now as tools for knowledge integration, and together with machine learning, for inverse inference network problems? Is that the answer? Is that going to be sufficient? Or is something else going to be needed? I would argue that the ontological work that's going on is critical, very useful foundation. We need consistent descriptions, knowing full well that we live in an inconsistent world, particularly if we want to do innovation. If we want to do competency about stuff that we know, sure. Ontologies are doubly important, but we'd better be sure that we're not falling into the scholastic trap of formalizing descriptions before we should be. However, one can also argue that all healthcare inverse inference problems are fundamentally underconstrained. Scientifically, the personalization requires new models for inference from generalities of phenotypic groups to individual genotypes of the group stratified by the whole health history of that individual from the day of birth onwards. 
as well as the context of environment and all the other factors. Clinically, we have to think about difficult issues that come up in game theory, balancing patient choices and decisions with those of the healthcare providers and all the other people involved in a healthcare decision. So today, what we see is incremental translational informatics. Clinical and epidemiological inference, which is based on existing models, and largely how and when to extract information from scientific models and texts, and the various heuristic and systematic application to individuals is done still largely by human smarts, right? But can we learn something from what has been going on at, in computational village, uh, vision and in game playing like the IBM Deep Blue Chess program as strategic analogies where we know we try to break down our problems in a way that we optimize the situation where brute force computational methods that have no relationship to human thinking or human cognition are applied and other parts of the problem where actually we can get cues from how we solve problems. So the question is how do we develop clinical and translational case-based applicability guidelines more scientifically? What are the different models of evidence as applied to decision making for different organizational, environmental, and social constraints. Now, we can think of it all as information, just stratify it, you know, different ways. But that ignores the semantics and the power of the semantic net. Not everything is the same basic information. There's great advantage in looking at everything just as a sea of information. But we want to take advantage of properly indexed according to different typologies of knowledge and of specific data types, knowledge elements, and apply them to whatever models we use, whether rational choice or bounded rationality models, or in the future, I would hope, models that use visual cognition, especially for exploration. And we do that informally now with a lot of human help with very powerful visualization models as well as abstract models which schematic but none of them are formal or very few of them are this is something that I wish we can get rid of uh, data mining again one of those wonderful reductionistic ideas introduced great flexibility into what we do with the analysis of data. At the same time, does a great disservice to what we want to do next, which is using the semantic web more fully for inverse inference. Statistical models of risk will have to explicitly incorporate much more structure and prior, prior assumptions. Mixtures of deterministic and stochastic simulation models. Big opportunity but a real problem which we have not fully confronted for over 20 years that we've been doing them fairly efficiently. Someone needs to come up with a breakthrough there with powerful automated interpretation models. How do you interweave interpretation playing off assumptions of a simulation, results that you get, prior conditions, how you posed your questions, what answers can you expect, can you trust them. Meaningful abstraction of results within biological contexts. Major challenge. It depends on our choice of ontologies. And I say it in the plural, multiple ontologies. Because there is no, very rarely one fully accepted universal model of reality. So, they're proliferating, but how to use them beyond superficial annotation to help link sources for complex queries is a critical hurdle. So what are some Gordian knots? What would be bioconsensus within a given modeling schema? And how do you break it? Since when we want to do innovation, we want to question assumptions. So here one group of experts comes, right? a specialty puts together a committee, spends many years, a lot of money, comes up with a consensus, 
only to have that simply st serve as straw man to be knocked down, right? But how do we do that with computational models, with computational representations? Interesting issues there. Right? How do we design not only declarative statements, right, but also procedural and, this is the hard part, automatically updatable computational ontologies for biomedicine? The business of automatically updatable, very tough, because there's a bit of a chicken and egg, you know, what kind of criterion do we use, right? Data knowledge, coherence of hypotheses, when does a theory reach critical mass without uh, falsifiability, and what are the boundaries for in biology, which is never strict falsifiability. And then, underneath it all, how do we represent the biomedical literature, both text and, very importantly, modeling the logic of arguments, of which a number of people have proposed models, none of them that have computationally scaled up very well or generalized very well. How do we tie that to annotation of images? How do we link to diagrammatic abstraction and the reasoning that goes with it that we seem to do so naturally from previous experiences? But we have yet to find a computer representation that does this even closely. I would say there's a way of thinking that may or may not help us, at least it presents a problem. Visual reasoning as opposed to just visualization. Visualizing object scenes is ubiqu ubiquitous. We have it all out there. But it's still largely user-dependent, idiosyncratic, and very poorly understood, both perceptually and cognitively. And the development of ontologies, which is so important, largely ignores this. So probably the most powerful role that we have for s establishing consistency when we look at a combination of text and image, right? We're not even touching, right? So we need to com formulate some sort of computational model for inverse inference using visual elements of reasoning. And I'd suggest going back to Charles Pierce with the three category, categories of referential associations, iconic, indexial, and symbolic, and tie it into the reference problem that, in effect, we are so effective at quickly solving problems because we know what to ground in representations that are closely related to what we see and what we share in our seeing, right, in our imaging, but which gets abstracted out when we have some kind of label signifier that we ha has developed evolutionarily in language, different for different languages. Often concepts are the same, but very often different, sometimes critically different, especially for important situations like medicine. So, these computational models for visual intelligence, hopefully is something that we would like to have so different disciplines can develop a common term of reference. There's still today theories, but increasingly supported by experimental results. So maybe we're getting to the point where a unified approach with experimental science may be possible. And I would suggest one key element that has, I think, been underappreciated, though it's very difficult, which is visual metaphors as part of inverse inference problem solutions. In other words, everything that we ground, we, as a first cut, exploratively, is grounding through different kinds of metaphors. Not everything, a lot. It's a critical, and the logic of how we apply it in suggesting problems, linking problems, is something that if we analyze more, maybe <laughs> some r really bright person will come up with a computational model 
for reasoning metaphorically. And one not too imaginative guess is build on what we have, right? Develop an explicit model of how iconic tuning lexical referencing is carried out. And throw in something that is often forgotten, which was David Marr's brilliant notion that was largely confirmed that we carry around two and a half dimensional sketches or mental models and use them in our computational vision and apply that to inverse inference problems as a specific case for the recently deceased mathematician Gelfand's, Israel Gelfand's conjecture that every actual problem that we try to solve has its own adequate language and that for inverse clinical diagnostic, what he called game problems, and he called them diagnostic games precisely because you, if you want a repetitive experiment, you want to be able to pose this to specialists and see if they can reproduce their inferences abstractly as well as concretely. And there was some preliminary work done on this in Russia. It hasn't been followed up. And I think we're getting to the point where there may be enough combination of our own insights in cognitive and perceptual science and what we know about computational modeling techniques that we may be ready to tackle this problem. As, for instance, using feedback from eye movements and fMRI and other modalities to at least get cues about what our brain activation patterns of thinking are during reasoning. Okay. So that's a first step towards this. Are we picking up something interesting from an evolutionary point of view? So what I'm suggesting then is just like systems biology attempts to unify on the biological side and influencing healthcare, so we need to develop something much more powerful in the form of evolutionary information systems that will have this visual component to it. Because if not, we are attacking problems with one hand tied behind our back or maybe one and a half hands tied behind our back. Okay. Oh. And tied to all of this is the great educational challenge that we all face. And going back to my role on the core competencies committee in EMEA, what on earth are we going to recommend for the people coming up and studying biomedical informatics? what is critical and what is optional or elective. And is it going to be different, obviously, if you're heading towards becoming a PhD, who is going to actually try to develop new techniques, make discoveries, or are you going to spend most of your life in the clinic, or are you going to combine them both? Is there some kind of interesting evolutionary systemics that ties into Dawkins' notion of the extended phenotype that we can be moving towards in human-machine interactions, you know, where some of the latest things that are happening in social networking are also relevant and allow for some incredible experiments with interesting and problematic ethical issues. So. A simple conclusion to this is hopefully we will have much more bridging of islands of innovation if we can think differently outside the box with some of these ideas and then ask ourselves what about our own favorite mix of analytics and knowledge integration techniques but what if we can tackle one of these harder problems in the context of a very specific translational medicine problem and see that there we'll get our inspiration. Thank you. So, oops, sorry. Don't know if you want to. Yes, Constantine.
researchers and assumption of the policy makers made uh, great progress in convincing uh, physicians to be more data driven. Mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, part of this picture is traditional medical command support of, of, of statistical models or medical expert systems and later much more acceptable and much more widespread support like guidelines, reminders and the like. Uh, what have we learned as a field, in your opinion, that can be used to convince biology mm -hmm. and other uh, researchers, uh, for instance, more of the fundamental questions of biology and science that obviously overlap with biomedicine, uh, with clinical biomedicine? Um, what have we learned and can we convince them to utilize some of the computational techniques? that exist today that can help them design experiments and interpret them rather than using strictly their intuition and experience? Well, successful examples would help. So I think there are situations where uh, the question was, uh, how can one ex take the experience from medical and health informatics with successful inverse inference and inverse problem solutions and apply them in bioinformatics or the biological side. And the answer is that it's happening. It has happened. Many bioinformaticians have used those techniques. On the other hand, the much greater focus of biological problems really presents a different problem context. You do have, usually, much more control. Now, the interesting thing with translational work is you have to bridge both paradigms. So in some sense, I would suggest a relaxation model going back and forth between the two. So there's probably a great opportunity for another Google-like experiment within the biomedical community if one knew how to come up with what I mentioned were those selection rules for what types of matches do you have between clinical problem types, solution of inverse problems there, versus somewhat comparable ones in a much more focused directed querying way in biology. And in biology, you also have usually many more, not always, but many more harder assumptions, that are firm assumptions that you can make. In the clinical environment, there are so many social and uh, psychological factors that are very hard to nail down. But the challenge is to do that, starting by how we characterize human interactions and uh, psychological profiles, social profiles, and so on. And uh, a lot of that, as we know from epi epidemiological studies, extremely valuable to know how to stratify your problem. Nothing wrong knowing how to bounce back and forth between the two. Uh, there's a question of scale as well as focus. And that's uh, also an interesting challenge. No, no clear solutions because it's across the scales. But I suppose one could say that our probabilistic methods, whether they be Bayesian or classical, allow us to think in terms of different envelope models of uncertainty around all our different types of knowledge. How to come up with computationally feasible, better methods than things that have been clever but not quite worked in the past, like Dempster Schaefer theory, fuzzy theory, which has worked in a few cases but not in others. Knowing what their roles are, where to apply them, that's the hard part. That's why you either go to a biostatistician or to an engineer or a biophysicist or someone who knows these models uh, clearly, bioinformatician. Um, and probably the greatest curse of having so much available on the 
web is that it's not curated. It's not, you don't have too much in, in the way of the kind of critical but well-known uh, authoritative commentary. It's the sort of thing that the Cochrane collaborations did in epidemiology. We, we need that in translational medicine, translational informatics. So probably have to have Cochrane Prime or whatever for, for translation. If that, if that begins to happen, I think we're on the right road. But not enough. Underlying models, semantics, and the business of the dynamics of the semantic web, and the fact that today's description logics just don't scale up computationally. And you can do all kinds of clever heuristic things combining them with other logical descriptions, but no systematic ground truth way computationally to, to really say, aha, I have the real answer for you, right to this inverse inverse problem. So no one's going to claim the successor to Hansfeld's <laughs> CT prize soon. But as a challenge, that's why you know I'm putting out the notion if someone does have a clever way of dealing with a computational theory of how we inject metaphor because it's the functionality of reasoning that we're missing in exploration there. Now for confirmation, confirmatory tests is a lot. Not all adequate, but there's a lot. But exploratory, both reasonably principled and efficient. That's what we're after. So I'm suggesting at least let's think in terms of potentially new paradigms as challenges. And the notion of adequate theories, in other words, not blind reductionism, but clear, careful choice that's specific to a given class of problems. If we can manage to come up with good ways of describing that, description languages that do that, just enough to get the job done for clinical situation. Very different than the much tougher problem of inverse inference of a whole model, which, as we know, is a problem shared in bio biomedicine with geophysics and many other systems, though with the added complication of having vast populations of uh, non-identical individuals, right? To try to figure out what to do with how, how we get that, which is you know, the simple statistical notion of getting robust estimates of parameters in the mean when looking at variances is great, but not enough, right? You need something more in terms of underlying models. Sorry. Other questions? Has anyone's favorite inverse inference problem been tickled? I hope. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you. <laughs>